everything you need to know about products and services that can improve your life. This is Experts on Call on CL 650. Well, thanks, Dwayne, our producer, for that great little lead-in because we're just about to talk about um, a bylaw enforcement cycle and hearings and about the fact that someone claims that they saw a dog in the complex. And so somebody makes a complaint to Strata Council and lo and behold, uh, they're complaining about the owner in Unit 201 who has a dog. We have a bylaw that prohibits cats and dogs. Uh, and so what does the Strata Council do? Well, the um, process for bylaw enforcement, Section 135 of the Act, I, I know I've already mentioned it tonight, but uh, I just can't emphasize it enough that a strata corporation has to follow a process to enforce a bylaw. Uh, and it's, it's actually, it can be a difficult process because strata says, well, I've seen the dog, they're in breach, uh, send them a fine. And while that might appear to be very common sense or logical, unfortunately, it's not what the Act requires. But so it's, a, it's a little dog. Nobody's, there's no noise, there's no problem. It's just a little dog. Well, do the bylaws permit little dogs? Because if they don't, then in little dog or big dog, it's a violation of the bylaws. So process-wise, the strata must, they've received a complaint. Now, strata, corp strata council members can be the complainers. So right. as the council president, I've walked down the hall, I've seen the little dog, and um, I'm, I bring it to council as uh, the complaint. So now the strata council writes to the owner and says, we've received a complaint that you have a dog. Um, they should set out the bylaw that says bylaw 3.6 provides no, no pets. They should then follow the process of saying you've got a reasonable opportunity to respond or have a hearing and that may be 14 or 21 days. And um, then they be, they're prepared and they wait. They do nothing else. They don't fine. They, they take no other action. They've sent the letter to the owner and they wait for the owner to respond. I always like to also include in those letters that if there's no response received, the Strata Council will make a decision based on the evidence it has. So the evidence right now is we've seen the little dog. So the owner is going to then respond, uh, presumably, and it may even request uh, a hearing. So now it's up to the owner. So I'm the owner, I've responded. Um, I am saying that I need the pet because um, I am suffering from um, depression and I've been to my doctor who said you should probably get a pet. Uh, and so I request a hearing. Uh, I go to council and they say, yes, I actually do have the dog. Um, I need it for medical purposes. Uh, and I'm hoping that there's some way we're gonna be able to allow me to keep my dog. Um, I uh, the council asks me a few questions, perhaps, maybe not. I leave the hearing. How does the council handle this now? Well, the <coughs> statement that the pet is a medical necessity changes everything. And so um, under the Human Rights Code, the Human Rights Code applies to strata corporations, and the Human Rights Code prevents strata corporations from discriminating against owners. And uh, I again, I will tell you that the first response of a strata council will say, we're not discriminating, no one can have a dog. So that's right. not discrimination. But the Human Rights Code views it a little differently. And their view is that if your decision impacts a person with a disability differently than it would others, then that is discrimination. So if I need my dog, and let's let's talk something a little s simpler maybe. Um, I, I, I'm visually impaired and I need my dog. No strata would imagine <coughs> ordering that dog to be removed. Right. So that, to do so, would impact that individual differently than others. And so that's a good example for human a human rights issue. As we move from the obvious, where maybe visual impairment, to the less obvious, such as depression, the issue becomes more difficult to assess on the part of the strata council. But what they're going to want is evidence that there is a medical disability and that the pet is required as a consequence. I mean, is it just a good thing to have a pet and anyone, you know, benefits from having a pet, or is it absolutely 
is it required in this instance? So the council is going to have to gather likely more information. And what they may do is respond to the owner, depending on what information the owner brought in, they may respond to the owner um, requesting evidence from the doctor and sort of medical reports, connecting. It has to, there has to be a connection between the medical disability and what's being sought. If there is a connection, the strata must accommodate. So when I think owners lose sight of this, though, and, and, and when I say owners, I'm saying owners, tenants, occupants within a building. I think they lose sight of the fact that when they're ax asking for an exemption from a bylaw, um, for a reason. So not just pets, hardship for example. They have uh, hardship and cannot pay their mortgage and they're asking for an exemption from a rental bylaw. What they lose sight of is that the Strata Corporation has an obligation to determine that there is a credible reason for this and in exchange for that the Strata Council can actually ask for the documentation and the personal information that they will need to rely on to defend the fact that they've given this exemption to this person. Absolutely. It's the strata's job to enforce the bylaws. And so if there's a no pet bylaw or a no rental bylaw and the owner is asking for some sort of accommodation, it's up to the owner to establish the basis for that accommodation. So the owner has to provide the evidence and the strata council has a right to ask it, in fact must ask for it. Because otherwise, if they don't, then it really looks like it's discretionary. Right. Well, you know, we <coughs> let Bill have a pet because we like Bill, but we don't like Bob, and Bob didn't get the pet. So Stratas have, um, if, they, if they don't have clear evidence on why they're making these decisions and accommodations, they, they run the risk of appearing um, very arbitrary and... and um, playing favorites, which is never good. We have a, we have a member um, in the Fraser Valley who just recently passed a pet bylaw, once again allowing pets, because so many people, including council members, got pets contrary to the bylaw, and it got uh, unrealistic. T it simply became unrealistic to enforce the bylaw. Well, and, and that's always something that Stratus should be looking at. Bylaws are appropriate at a per point in time. And times change and people change. And so what was appropriate for our community three years ago or six years ago may not be appropriate today. Our whole community may have aged collectively. And we may find that it's healthy for all of us to have a little pet of some sort, a little dog, cat, something for company, for people who are alone, something that gets us out of the house to go for a little walk. And, and so our needs change and the bylaws should accommodate that. So we've done the hearing. We've heard the hearing from the owner. Um, the owner can't produce any evidence for us that this is really, in fact, an issue. Um, we now have an issue where we have a pet. Um, the hearing's over. We sent um, the owner a letter advising that they have 14 days to remove the pet, at which time if they don't, and, and this is discretionary at this point, what time, type of period the council wants to give the owner, um, if they don't remove the pet, the strata will start fining the owner. Uh, we go down the road that we're fining now. We're, the bylaw says $200 a month, so we're now fining $200 a month. The fines are racking up. The owner's not getting rid of the pet. We've got complaints from other owners. What's our next step? Well, today, the next step would be a court application for an order to remove the pet. And that's which, what jurisdiction? British Columbia Supreme Court. So it's a costly application. Um, it can be. Yeah. It can be. Um, a, a couple of things have to happen as well. Before the Strata Corporation makes that application, they need to get a three-quarter vote of the owners right. to proceed to court. And, and it's a dilemma for Stratus because on the one hand, they're enforcing or attempting to enforce a bylaw. They're fining an owner. On the other hand, the owner's not paying. So there's really been no change in behavior, which is really what the whole point of bylaw enforcement is. You right. want the owner to change their conduct. An owner that doesn't change their conduct, stratas then are in a position where nothing's happening. Uh, they really need to take it up to the next step. The next step is a BC Supreme Court court application, and um, that requires a three-quarter vote. The difficulty, of course, if the owners, if the strata doesn't put it to the owners for a vote, or if the owners don't vote in favor of proceeding to court, is you've effectively gutted your pet bylaw. Right. Yeah, you've you've disarmed your strata council. They can't the do anything else about it. Exactly. The next owner that brings in a pet, um, you're not going to be able to enforce it against them. And word spreads very quickly that there's nothing the strata is going to be able to do. Which is a change that we're going to see with the Civil Resolution Tribunal because that is one of the 
one of the uh, decisions the tribunal will be able to issue will be orders for compliance with bylaws. And that's, that's going to be significant because the costs are quite small. Uh, in comparison overall. So, you know, strata corporations may still use legal services and professional services and consulting on how to deal with the enforcement, um, but the time period and the costs will be significantly different. So, and it may not require a three quarters vote of the strata corporation, depending on how the um, amendments occur to the legislation. Like small claims, it may allow stratas with a bylaw to go to the tribunal without the need for a three quarters vote. And I think that that actually is going to make a huge difference in the operation of strata corporations because I know that there are many owners today that take the view um, there's nothing they can do about it. That the bylaws are, are breached and conduct is, is such that um, other people are complaining and find it offensive and yet the, the owner responsible says, well, they're certainly not going to spend the money to take me to court. so let them find me. We also have a limitation period um, change which permits uh, or establishes a limitation period of two years. If they have, if Strata hasn't taken action in two years, the limitation period prevents collection. So um, a lot of owners are aware of this and just say, uh, go ahead, find me, because I know that you're not going to go to court and at the end of two years these fines will disappear. Well, we'll be looking forward to the implementation of the tribunal this year to see how it's going to help Strata corporations with enforcement. You're listening to Tony Gioventu on 650 Sea Isle, and Adrian Murray, a lawyer with Hammerberg & Partners, is with us in the studio, and we'll be back in a few moments. This is Experts on Call on Sea Isle 650.